Anyway, 1 Thessalonians. What do you know about 1 Thessalonians? Or the book of Thessalonians? What do you know about it? Uh, you said it was the first, the it, oldest? This is one of the oldest, or one of the first books in the New Testament. This is one of the first New Testament books. There's, a, there's three books that might be a runner-up to it. All right? And, and who knows what those other, other two books might be? The Gospel of Mark. They don't know how old the Gospel of Mark is. I can tell you this much that has been in recent discovery in the last ten years. When they were, uh, they continued to, to excavate the Dead Sea Scrolls. How many of you took the classes on the Dead Sea Scrolls that I taught here? All right. If you want that, there's only four classes that you can get those. You can borrow them, bring them back, or buy them, whatever you want to. They're not there much money. But I talked about the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were a bunch of scribes and religious sect of people that lived down by the Dead Sea, down near Jericho. And uh, they wrote a lot of copies of the Bible, the Old Testament, and they found one partial Gospel of Mark, the oldest known Gospel of Mark. And it was written, that copy of it was, had to be written before 68 A.D., because they destroyed the whole area in 68 A.D. So somewhere before that, this had to be written. And they and it's the oldest copy that's ever been known of the Gospel of Mark because they had a couple of copies of this copy and it had something different in one verse than any other, any other copy. And they think that it was probably one of the, uh, close to the original manuscripts. But that had to be before 68 A.D. All right. And what was the other book that is very old in the New Testament, and we don't know how old it is? Uh, possibly from A.D. 45 to 62, somewhere between 45 and 62. And what was that? Well, you're starting to learn a little bit about things. That's, it. That's the book of James. Okay, the book of James was written by Jesus' half-brother. And it is probably the most Jewish book of all the books in the New Testament. Well, First Thessalonians. Now, this is a, a city, and it is, uh, well, I'll tell you a little bit about it. It was written from Corinth about A.D. 50. So this makes it a very early church letter. Now. And this is part of the New Testament. And by the way, Paul, when he, when he writes in here, you're going to see later on, Paul is going to be telling you that the words that he is receiving from God have been confirmed by what? Remember, Brother Phil taught on Sunday night. He taught on the miracles here a while back. How, what, why, did the, the, why did the apostles perform miracles? What was the purpose of the miracles? To show their authority. The what? To show their authority. To show that they were... Uh, sent out with authority by God. And, and Marilyn? That's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. They were sent out by authority. These were to confirm the miracles, the, mir the, the, the early miracles in the church age were to confirm the Word of God. That's the purpose of them, to confirm the Word of God. In other words, that, they, that the Word of God that they were receiving and that these apostles, that the power of God was with them and they were receiving revelation. Because what was the only revelation that all the churches had up until that time? Just what? Just the Old Testament. Just the Old Testament scriptures. All right. Now the Old Scripture, Testament scriptures are very valid, but we have a new covenant, New Testament churches today. The old covenant was under Israel. Well, Israel God set aside because of their ungodliness, and they rejected the King of Israel. All right. But now we have. New Testament churches, and we have instructions. And one of the very first books that was ever passed around that give New Testament churches instruction was this letter right here. So it's, it's some very important information that we have. All right? Paul had planted an infant church in the city of Thessalonica. All right. What about Thessalonians? What about Thessalonians? Did Thessalonia have an earlier name than this? Where did Thessalonia come from? Well, it was uh, perhaps Thessalonica to 
Alexander the Great. That's right. The whole name of this city was Therma because they had hot springs. You ever heard of California hot springs, desert hot springs, all that kind of stuff? This is the kind of a place because there were hot springs there. And it was called Therma. In Greek, that means hot. Therma, thermos in English. Okay, we get that word Therma. So it was called Therma, or the hot spring area. <clears throat> After, uh, in about 315 B.C., before Christ, this city was renamed Thessalonia. After Thessalonia, that's Alexander the Great's sister. All right, that's how it got that name. That was a very rich city. It was a city of about 200,000 people when Paul went there. Now, <clears throat> Paul basically didn't even try to preach in little cities. Did you know that? There was a reason behind it. It was a very scriptural reason, too. When Paul went into any new area, he went to the biggest city that he could find to preach in. He would preach in that city and there would be converts made. He would baptize those converts by the church. Well, he was sent out by the Jerusalem church, basically. He would baptize these converts and he would form a New Testament church. Now, there are some groups of Baptists in the world that do not, well, let's put it this way. They start missions instead of churches so they can get other churches to help support missions. You'll never find in the Bible where any mission is started. Mich missionary pastors are sent out, okay? But no missions are started. They are, they are founding churches. Now, there's a lot of controversy over this, but uh, just... When it gets down to the black and white and the scriptural way to do things, you don't go out and establish missions, you establish churches. That's what would be the difference between a mission and a church? Well, to tell you the truth, I can't find any reference to a mission in the Bible, but that's not what some people are doing. I mean, I mean when they establish a mission, what nowadays? What what, what, well, what usually these groups of people, and it's usually little uh, independent Baptists, groups, and they go out and they establish a mission, and that mission is under the wing of a New Testament church someplace, and they send, and they pay for the pastor, and then other churches will, in a uh, cooperative effort, support the pastor so he can build up the mission until it can become a church. But you show me in the New Testament where they established any mission, period. They established churches, and this was an infant church right here. And Paul established a church, not a mission, Okay. And that's an unscriptural way to do things. It's kind of, I don't think it's any worse than taking alien immersion or open communion, to tell you the truth. Catholicism, maybe? Because they had missions. Yes. Catholicism does do that. Now, Catholicism does start missions, but of course, Catholicism does not go by the Word of God either. I mean, they don't understand. That's dogma. Well, let's go on and look a little bit more. And this was about A.D. 49 or A.D. 50 when Paul was here. Now, he planted this infant church, church, not mission, in the city of Thessalonia. But he had to leave it. This church was uh, Paul's, one of Paul's most fruitful early endeavors. Now, turn with, for me, somebody that has a New Testament, and turn to Acts, the 17th chapter. Acts, the 17th chapter, because this is where the history. Now, what the, the book of Acts is called the Acts of the Apostles. I don't like to call it the Acts of the Apostles. I like to call it the Acts of the Churches. All right? The Acts of the Churches. It's, boy, here's my star student right here. i got to have him down here in front. Young lady, it's good to have you here. Later or not, it doesn't make any difference. We're on 1 Thessalonians. And we're studying the history of 1 Thessalonians. And don't forget to stay afterwards and get your tapes from last week. All right? Well... Acts 17, 1 through 10. Who has Acts 17, 1 through 10? Brother, do you have that? Can you read that loud for me? Now, when they had passed through, and I can't read those words, but uh, they came to Thessalonica, where, yeah. where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. All right. Now let's stay right there for just a moment. I want to, to translate something for you correctly. Okay. Uh, uh, the word Sabbath. 
Now the Sabbath is the last day of the week. What day is the last day of the week? Saturday. 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 All right. The Sabbath has always been on Saturday. The Sabbath is not on Sunday. It's Saturday. But there's two terms. It's Sabbaton in Greek. All right. This word Sabbath or Sabbaton in Greek means also a week. When you when you complete seven days, you now have a week. So it's called a Sabbath week. So so write down some place in the column there that this is one week. All right, one week. The Sabbath is a week long. All right, that means seven days also. So how long did Paul preach here? Three weeks. Three weeks. That's now that's a better translation of it. Okay, three weeks. Three weeks. Now you have to realize the Apostle Paul was not a lazy preacher. A lot of lazy preachers only want to preach on Sunday morning. Well, he his main day was Saturday morning. All right, but uh, he preached every day in the city. And when he made these converts, and he got up in there and was making converts, now he would preach to them as long as he had breath. My wife says I talk too much. I talk all the time. Well, I tell you what, God doesn't talk. Doesn't get black people to preach for him. I used to preach five hours every day in the seminary. I can't do that anymore. When I finish tonight, I'm going to have a sore throat. It does that every week. I don't know why. I'm just getting old, I guess, and decrepit. Mm -hmm. All right. Not you. But I still do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, today at home, I was witnessing. When I talk to people on the phone, I'm witnessing to them. Wherever you go, you witness to people. When they call you on the phone, if you have an opportunity, pray. When you go in some place, pray that you will become a blessing for somebody there, that you'll be able to witness to them in some way. So Paul was doing that, and so he was there three weeks. What's three times seven? 21 days. He was there only 21 days, and maybe a little bit more. We don't know, but it says three weeks. That's what the scriptures say. That's the evidence that we have that Paul was there at least three weeks. Well, boy, he was doing something three weeks. He established a church in three weeks. Not a mission, but a church. Go ahead, brother. Opening and alleging that Christ must, must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks a, mul a great multi multitude and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews... All right, now let go back just a little bit. I want to tell you something about Paul and Silas. And uh, who was the other guy named that was here? Paul, Silas? Huh? All right, Timothy. Yeah. Paul and... Well, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, these three. Okay. Paul and Silas and Timothy. Now you're going to send Timothy back later. Now what does Paul mean? By the way, what's the name, feminine name for Paul? Paul. Pauline. All right. What does that name mean? It means little. Well, what, what about Sylvanus? What's the what's the feminine name for that? Sylvia. Sylvia. And what does that mean? Sable. Stable. What about Timothy? Have you ever heard a woman called Timon? All right. All right, Timon. That's a very unusual name. But what does Timothy mean? Honorable. Little, dependable, and, on and honorable. <laughs> That's what their names. Little, dependable, and honorable. Okay. Now, go ahead, brother. I just thought I'd throw that one at you while you're, while you're at it. These names mean something. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. Of the baser sort. They, they took a mob. They went out in, in the bars and got them a mob. <laughs> Here these religious dudes go out in the bars and, and, get, and get up a mob of, of lowdowns. I mean, these are gutter snipes. These are bu gutter bones. These are homeless people of the day that, that cut people's throats for their next bottle of wine. That's what they went on God. They incorporated the ilk of the day. They said worthless loafers. That's 
natural height. My nose. I went out and got these bones, these cutthroats and gangers. <coughs> Go ahead, brother. That's who they incorporated. And gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. But Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security, taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. All right, let's go back here and figure out a couple of things. We're getting what happened in Thessalonica. Why did Paul have to leave? Here we have a bunch of perjury going on. We have perjury. You know what perjury is? It's when you lie to a court. Mm -hmm. This uh, they they they, uh, they got a pledge from Jason. You know what that was? In modern terms, they got a, he had he had to get out of jail on a bail bond. This is a bail bond. All right, a bail bond. Right now, a bail bond there someplace. Because that's what happened. They had they had arrested him. And these and, and it says that when they did not find him, they kept on dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities to the courthouse. They drug him down to the courthouse and started bringing charges against him. What did they do to Jesus? <laughs> Same story, wasn't it? All right. Here we... It, exciting trial here now. A trial made up of absolutely nothing. They accused Jesus of being the king of the Jews, didn't they? What did Pilate write over his head? King. The king of the Jews. Mm. And they said, don't do that. Just say that he said that. He said, I've written what I've written. Shut your mouths. I don't want to hear any more out of you. Just go on and tell you being someplace else. So they, they arrested this man... And that he's now, he's out on bail bond, and they're going after Paul and Silas. All right? They're going after these guys. What are they going to do to them, you think? What do they do to Jesus? They want to kill them. They're going to murder them. They're going to commit perjury. They're going to commit crimes against these people. Crimes. These are not, these are religious people now. They were in church. These are the these are the head administrators of this church here. It was called a synagogue. We use the term church and assembly. It actually is a synagogue is the place where they assemble. They went to the to the synagogue, the place where they assembled, and Paul started preaching Jesus Christ and preaching the resurrection. Well, they got mad. These Jews got mad, and so they started pulling the same thing that the Jews in Jerusalem did. And they wanted to kill Paul and Silas and Timothy and these. They wanted to kill them. Well, let's go on a little bit further, brother. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea. All right. And what did they do there in Berea? Uh, who coming thither went into the synagogues of the Jews. All right, didn't slow him down one bit, did he? <laughs> I mean, why down one scrape right into another? The, Paul was considered an outlaw. One time he was a sheriff, wasn't he? Going out beating up people and arresting them and, and killing people and hanging them by the neck and whatever he could do to them. Verse 10, And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived there, they started teaching again in the synagogues of the Jews. All right? Now, I want you to on down just a little bit further. All right. Now, guess what happens when he goes to Berea? Well, let's go 11. Now, there were many noble-minded me, noble-minded men uh, more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness. Now these Jews did examining the scriptures daily to see what these sayings were so.
actually kept on being so. Many of them therefore believed along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. And when the Jews of Thessalonia, look at that, when the Jews of Thessalonia found out about the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul and Maria also, what did they do? They came there likewise agitating and stirring up the what? The mobs again. Mobs. Talk about it. These people are intentional thugs. Intentional thugs. And then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go so far as to see and Silas and Timothy remained there. So here we have another thing. Paul has to leave again because they're going to, these Jews are going to kill him. So that's the settings that we have here in 1 Thessalonians. That's why Paul left this church. So quickly. How long did he preach here that we know about from the scriptures? Three Sabbath weeks. All right, maybe a little bit longer. We don't know. All right, let's go on a little bit more. <clears throat> Paul's early departure from this little infant assembly exposed them to persecution from without. Now, I want you to remember this. This is the way God's churches are attacked. This is the way God's churches are attacked. There is persecution from without and heresy from within. Think about that for just a little while. That's the fifth column, isn't it? That's infiltration. Now, how many of you ever heard of the KGB, the CIA, the FBI, and uh, the SS troopers and, and all of this? These are all uh, uh, what we call covert operations. Secret espionage. Do you see any espionage here in Thessalonia and in Berea? Do you see these uh, sneaks sneaking around and, and uh, uh, seeing what they can get into? You know, I went to school down at the California Missionary Baptist Institute with a man that went down there. Uh, I want to, I tell you what, there's espionage among us always. Now that. That school was a very, very orthodox school. Probably one of the most orthodox Baptist schools in America <coughs> that's ever been, probably. There was a guy that went down there and went to school, and he had a wife and children. He surrendered as a missionary in one of the churches down there. I believe it was Anaheim Church where Brother Madden was. He surrendered to preach in that school, and he went to the school for five years. I think he at least got a master's degree. And he went out into, guess, if you would want to, back in that period, this is the 60s and 70s, if you had wanted to send a CIA man, where would you have sent him? Colombia. The drug money. America has, a, has financed many, many covert operations by drug money. And this was one of the men, believe it or not, this is one of the men. I went to school with a man. And Brother Hubbard's Bible that I have that his, his daughter gave to me when he died, his name is in that Bible that he signed. That man went down in Columbia and, 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 uh, and was in the CIA. All the time that he went to school, he went to churches all over the America making speeches and getting the support. And he went down there and there was a lot of people saying it under his ministry. Mm -hmm. But several years later, he just went haywire. He took off and did all kinds of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. And he said, what in the world happened to this dude? He was running from the CIA. He got under real conviction. The woman that he was living with was really not his wife. That was all set up. It was all a double mm -hmm. life. It wasn't his wife. <laughs> they got under conviction. Somehow or another, along the trail, he got under conviction. And he was saved. And he ran back up to Brother Madden. I remember Brother Madden talking about him. He come up there and he said, you know, can you imagine this big dude here, where he is up here, this monster? I'm standing on the six-inch step beside him, and he's still puts all over me. What are you doing? What's wrong with you? He started crying. He said, 
He said, I heard you got married down there. Did you have why she wasn't my wife? He started telling the story. And he said, boy, I'm going to tell this guy. They're after to kill him. I mean, he's running from the CIA now. Well, it's the same Colbert organizations back at this period of time. Things haven't changed one bit. And if you can imagine somebody sneaking into a little Orthodox Baptist church and going all the way through school, going down and building churches, and what God, God bless you for it. Remember I told you that if a parrot could preach, if a frog could croak, if a squirrel could squeak it, or a lizard could lurk it, that God would absolutely bless his word. And he does. Even through that situation. Well, I don't know. I think he finally straightened his life out. Maybe he got out with the skin of his teeth. I don't know. Because I, I don't know about whatever happened to him. But weird things happen in God's work. And from without, we have persecution. And from in, within, we have heresy. And sometimes we have infiltration. Brother Madden. And I told you this before, and you're probably getting tired of it. He said, if all the whores could get saved before the joins the Lord's churches, and all the whoremongers, and all the, the cigarette suckers, and all the gamblers, and the bingo nuts, and the card players, and the winos, and get saved before they join God's churches, they'd have a lot better chance of getting the gospel. Because people like that slow down the truth, don't they? When you get lost people in God's churches, it causes problems. And here we have a guy, a missionary, that's lost. I remember Brother Martin Cannon one time preached up the California Saved Association and he preached uh, uh, One More Night with the Frogs. How many of you ever listened to that sermon on that? Go to the website, discovertheword.com, and go to Mar Dr. Martin Cannon and get One More Night with the Frogs and listen to that sermon that he preached. It was a lot like uh, uh, R.G. Lee's Payday Sunday. It was that kind of a sermon. Well, he preached that sermon up there, and I mean, he gave an invitation. Now, all that said association meetings are preachers and deacons and preachers' wives and deacons' wives and things like that. Very seldom I'm a Sunday school teacher or something in here. And here comes all these bawling people down the aisle. Some of them got saved. Some of them repented. Well, you get these kind of people in God's churches, even in God's churches. And the devil is trying to infiltrate God's work. And that's what he's doing here. He's, got, he's putting heresy from within. The church was not very doctrinally sound yet when Paul had to leave it. And Paul had to leave it because of what? Persecution. Religious nuts. Paul later sent Timothy back to check on the church's well-being. After Timothy returned to Paul at Corinth in Acts 18 and verse 5, okay, 18 and verse 5, he brought back good news and bad news. The good news was that this little assembly was steadfast and zealous and the gospel was being preached. The bad news was that these Jews kept on causing trouble. And the Jews that were causing trouble mixed up the people that were in the church. They had some doctrinal and ethical problems. Ethical. What's ethical? Now this is a, a, a church, I mean a city of 200,000 people, so it's a big big city. We, what do you got in big cities? Crime. Crime. Crime and moral slothfulness. Well, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1, or 4, 4 through 8. How many, have you got that? Have you got that one? 1 Thessalonians 4, 4 through 8. Let's look at that. 1 Thessalonians 4, 4 through 8. We're going to see uh, a problem that they were having here. We need to look at this because this is, the setting of the letter. 1 Thessalonians 4, 4 through 8. All right. What have we got here? If you wanna, have you got that young man? I don't. I don't you don't have? have? Okay. Young man. Dennis. Yeah. Go ahead, Dennis. Read her, read her loud. There's a shout her out. That 
every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in the sanctification and honor. In sanctification and honor. Yes. Not in the lust of... That's a nice word there. Lustful passion. Okay, lustful passion, even as the Gentiles which know not God. All right, the Gentiles don't know God. These people don't, don't know God. Don't act like heathers. Remember what Brother Madden says? If you get these people saved before they get to the churches, you've got a lot better chance of getting the gospel out. All right. Epithumios pathe is what it means. To hold something upon the mind, the lust, lustful passions. All right. Go ahead. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanliness, but unto holiness. Okay, now a better translation is God has not called us for the purpose of impurity in our Im immorality in our lives. And but to sanctification, setting ourselves aside before God. Okay? Number eight. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. Now, all right, here's what he says here. He says, consequently, he who rejects this letter, is what he's called, he who rejects this inspired instruction from God is not is not. He is not rejecting me, but he is rejecting God. Okay? Because this is God's. This is coming from God. And, and what, why did Paul say that this was coming to God? Power of miracles that he was performing. And the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Let's go on. We're going to get some doctrinal background. Now, there was moral issues. And then number two. They didn't have a sound foundation on the doctrine of eschatology. They did not have a sound foundation on the doctrine of eschatology. What's eschatology? It comes right out of Greek. Last things. All right, last things. They didn't have a sound understanding of the end times. See... Jesus talked about returning. He talked about judgment. In Matthew, the 23rd and 24th chapter, he talked about judgment, that God was going to judge Israel. Now, already Israel was beginning to be judged. I mean, in AD 70, the temple was completely destroyed. It was still standing right now, but God's... These Jews were sticking their necks out and getting ready to get in trouble. Back in history, they were a thorn in the flesh of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire tried to get along with these people, but they kept on insulting the emperors. Now, the churches did not insult the emperor. They paid their taxes. They did whatever. The Jews, I tell you what, if they were so tight, they looked over the glasses to keep them wearing them out. They were tight wops. They squeezed every nickel they could, they, could, they could hold on to. They didn't want to give up one dime that they didn't have to. They had to be forced to give. And they and by the way, in, in the 80s, 60s, they were revolting all over the land and to try to separate from Rome, to try to get an independence. And really, what? they weren't in that bad of shape under Rome. They weren't really in that bad of shape. You know, if you look back in history, look back at our old land right here, you ever heard of the, Bal the Boston uh, Tea Party? That's when some of the some of these people over here on this side of the water uh, got all excited and they dressed up like a bunch of Indians. You know, they were always blaming things on us. They? they dressed up like Indians and, and, and burned the ship up and, and uh, threw all the tea in the, in the water. And that's what they call the Boston Tea Party. You know why they did that? Because, because England was going to charge them a tax on tea. Now what? I'll tell you what. We got taxes on everything. They even got a tax on sin, they say. <laughs> That'd be all right if it's really taxed. I mean, 
There's taxes on everything today. They had a lot better under, under England at that time. Well, the Jews never wanted to bow down to anybody. They wanted everybody to bow down to them. But God was setting them up. He was setting them up to be dispersed throughout the world. He allowed them to have wicked hearts, greedy hearts, so on and so forth. Now this early little church thought that those that had died and gone on to be with the Lord before the rapture, we look, we're going to look at the word parousia. 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 Parousia comes from two Greek words, para and usia, or para, and if you go all the way back, it's para and amy. Epsilon, iota, mu, iota. Okay? It means beside to be. Beside, para, to be. Alright? Beside being in this participle form here, basically. A verbal word is parousia. It is the sign coming. Now, when Jesus comes back for his people, he's not going to it's not going to be a big battleground or anything else. He's going to come back and he's going to, to rapture all of the saved. They're going to just disappear off the earth. And before, just before that happens, he is going to open up the graves and all the dead people are going to be rising and when they get up about six feet tall, then the saved people, uh, the, the live people are going to be raptured also. So this takes place at that time. Now these people did not understand that. They thought that, that the dead in Christ were going to be some way disadvantaged over the saved people. And that's what we know. And this, by this letter, this first New Testament letter probably, this tells us about the rapture, which half of Christendom will not even accept. You talk to the Church of Christ or you talk to Presbyterians or uh, the covenant people about the rapture of God's churches and they go, oh, I don't believe in that. The first New Testament letter was written about the rapture. They haven't got to kindergarten yet. If the first New Testament letter was written about this, then we ought to pay some attention to it. First Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 tells us about the rapture. And we're going to get that when we get to that when we get there. Now, these young Christians were being perjured and accused of, of committing treason against Rome by these Jewish lawyers that were going to the courts. Now we already have these people out on bail. We already have them out on bail, don't they? They, went, they were thrown in jail and they got a bail bondsman and got them out on jail. Out on bail. Are you reading it from Acts? Well, I'm just, I'm ad-libbing from Acts. Ad-libbing from Acts. We're working a lot of church history probably not going to get much in that. We might get into verse number one tonight. Well, Paul writes back and tells them. By the way, Paul used scribes. A scribe. You know what they were called? Amenensis. That's the technical term. Amenensis. These scribes that wrote down the letters like for Paul and then Paul would write his name at the end of it. Now he'll... he'll he will refer to this. The only reason why I'm telling you this, the scribe, this ominensis that took this letter down for him, Paul said, you'll see my signature at the end of all my letters. If they're truly my letters. Because people were pawning off letters and writing Paul's name to it. Alright? And, of course, now this is the first letter. Evidently, there were false letters sent out before Paul sent the first inspired letter out. So there must have been false letters out there also. Let's go on a little bit further. Now, some of these people in, Thess in Thessalonica had quit working and just expected the Lord to come back. Have we had cults that, done, that have done this in our days? Ah, they get all their money and they give all their money to the leader of the group and they go off and live in some commune someplace and expect the Lord to come back in any day now. While the Jehovah Witnesses have told this, sold this story so many times, it's unbelievable. I don't know how in the world that people have, can be so gullible except it's demonically influenced. 
The Lord was supposed to come back in 1914. Then he was supposed to come back in 1917. And now they tell everybody that Jesus Christ lives in Brooklyn, New York. And that he is the head of the Watchtower organization. That he's really there and he's really running the Watchtower. That's not what my Bible says. But I guess they have to come up with some reason for their stupidity and practices that they're doing. Well, the Jews were bringing charges of treason against this early church, these early church members here because they said that they won't, they won't bow down to, to the king, to Caesar, as king. And when Jesus was crucified on the cross, it says, this is the king of the Jews. Well, Jesus never claimed to be the king of this world at that time, did he? At the time when Jesus came to this earth, who is the king of the prince of this world? The prince of the power of this age. Satan. He didn't claim that. He established his earthly kingdom here. And he left an administrator in that kingdom here. And that administrator was that little church that he left in Jerusalem. And, he, and, and already... That little church had spread out and founded other churches with these missionaries. They had gone out and founded churches. I want, to, I want you to understand, he founded churches, not missions. Okay? Churches. I don't think the Southern Baptist Convention would go out and found a mission. Do you know that? They would found a church. And at least got that right. <laughs> I want to drive that across. Now, out of all these 200,000 people that lived in this area, I don't know how big this church was, one of these little New Testament churches, but this little church was teaching and it was influencing people all over. And some of these people had quit working and was just waiting for the Lord to come back and they wouldn't go, on, they wouldn't go to work. Paul said, get back to work. Live, your day, live every day as if the Lord's coming back today. But do what you're supposed to do. You have to feed your families and everything. Don't be a burden on other people. Paul tells them, I wasn't a burden on you. I was a tent maker while I was there for three whole weeks before he got ran out of town. Well, in this letter, he straightens out all those problems. Now let's go there to, to 1 Thessalonians 1 and 1. Hina, Hina. Yeah, 1 and 1. Pros Thessalonis Thessalonicus Alpha. Pros Thessalonicus Alpha. That's what it says up there, the title of it. Paulus, Kai, Silvanus, Kai, Timotheus, Te, Ecclesiae, Thessalonicon, Kion. In, the you, Patri, Kai, Kiryu, Mesu, Christo, Karis, Himen, Kai, Irani. That was an easy verse, wasn't it? You said those those words so well. Paulos, Kai, Silvanos, Kai, Timotheus, Te, Ecclesia, Thessalon, Thessalonikion. And to you, Patri, Kai, Kudio, Esu, Christu, Karis, Amen, Kai, and Remi. It's a beautiful verse. Paulus, small guy, and faithful guy, and honorable guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's, the, that's what the names mean. So, Venus, the, uh, that comes from the word wood or tree, a sturdy being, okay? So, Venus, and Timotheus. The little, the strong, and the faithful. To the church, to the ecclesia, the ecclesia. Turn this one over. To the ecclesia, to the ecclesia, the the assembly. That's how that, that term should be translated. To the ecclesia, to the, to the assembly, to the ones called out. The local visible assembly meeting in this place, in this city. 
this church. The word ek ek ekklesia came from an old Greek word that was that was well known. Every city in the Roman and in the Greek Empire had a, an ecclesia in it, which was the subpoenaed, called out rulers of that area. They were the ones that were elected. And we are going to look, turn in, we're going to look at the word election here also. God elects us. You're going to see two terms. Yes, Mary. Uh, so an ecclesia could be two or more. For there are two or three gathered together in my name, I'll be with you. Okay. In my authority, I'll be with you. Any New Testament church anywhere in the world, you don't have to have 400. Any New Testament church, any place in the world, two or three people gathered together in the authority of Jesus Christ, he said he would be in the midst of them. All right. To the church to the assembly belonging to the Thessalonians. All right, to the Thessalonians. In God. Who does it belong to? In God. It's founded in God. It's founded by God. It's founded through God. It's founded upon the rock, which is Jesus Christ. And then it says, In God the Father. God the Father. God the Father. Now, it doesn't say the there, but, it, but the, that's what it means. You can put that in there. Because there's only one God, the Father, isn't there? Yes, and one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it uses the whole title of Jesus, doesn't it? Kyrio Jesus Christu. Kyrio. Jehovah. The word Kyrio means Jehovah. That's Jehovah God. Right there. Kyrio. Kyrio is the anointed one. It is the God that would become flesh, John 1 and 1. In the beginning, kept on being the Jehovah, and the Jehovah kept on being an inseparable part of the Godhead, and the Word, or the Jehovah, kept on being God. And then it says in John 1, 14, Kai, ho, logo, starts again, And the Word, the Jehovah, flesh became. Now that ought to make it real straight. You know, if I was a Jehovah Witness, I'd throw away the Gospel of John. I throw away first, second, and third John, but I throw away the book of Revelation. Well, the Muslims do that. The Muslims say that they believe the, the Bible, the New Testament, and the Old Testament, where it's correct. Except that they don't accept the Gospel of John. They don't accept first, second, and third John. They don't accept the book of Revelation because they said John wrote about Jesus as if he was God. At least they have enough sense to believe that. Because John did write about Jesus. Matter of fact, you're going to have to get rid of, through, finish. I mean, you're going to have to throw off the book of Colossians, too. Because the reason why uh, Paul wrote the book of Colossians was to prove the deity of the person of Jesus Christ. The deity means that he was God. That he was God. He was Jehovah. Now, to be theologically honest, you have to kick those books out or you have to believe them. You can take them and rest the scriptures for your damnation if you want to, and that's exactly what many people have done, and that's what they were doing there in Thessalonica too. In God the Father and uh, Jehovah, the Lord, Jehovah, Asus. This word Asus, how should it be translated there? How should it actually be? What what we got the word Jesus or Asus. That's the Greek name for what? What? Joshua. Joshua. And what does Joshua mean? What does the name Jesus or Joshua mean? Jehovah saves. Boy, if you could only just look at the words and see what the titles of Jesus mean, then you would understand who he was. Jesus, Jehovah saves, and then it says Christo. That means the anointed one. He was the anointed by God to be the Messiah. He was God in the flesh. John 1.18 says, The only begotten God. Is Jesus God? Well, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses take that verse, the only begotten God, and they say, well, see there, he was a God, not the God of heaven. But the Bible says that there is no other God but God. 
So when the Bible's talking about God, what do you think he's talking about? God. Not talking about some little God or some created God. To be God, you can't be created by God. Did you know that? Because when you are created, then you're no longer God. Now, the old Greek idea and the pagan idea was, and the Roman idea, Roman mythology was, that way back in time, that these, there was a great creator, and he made little lesser creators, these little eons. And they went out creating little things. And the Jehovah Witnesses and a lot of these other groups, the, the Unitarians and the Universalists, the Unitarian Universalists, Unity, School of Christianity, a whole bunch of these things, they believe that Jesus was one of those eons, the Greek mythology idea of, of a God. It was supernatural being, all right, but not God. That's where Arius of Alexandria, and that's where Charles Taze Russell and, and, uh, and all of that bunch. I remember you remember Garthead Armstrong, the world today. No, remember that? Wyatt Russell. Sounded good. Now did. The devil, I tell you what, a lie can get a hundred miles before the truth can get its boots on. That thing went worldwide. How many of you ever saw Herbert W. Armstrong or, or Garner Ted Armstrong out there visiting with Sadat or something, you know? And they're always handing something to each other. Well, Garnett Ted Armstrong, or Herbert Armstrong, would say, Hey, Sadat, I've got $2 million for you. Can I come over and take pictures with you, handing me this check for goodwill? He'd go over and give the guy $2 million. And who's paying for this? All these people that are triple tithing in the worldwide church of God. Triple tithing. They, the man, triple tithing. Well, he'd get his picture with them and they'd put it in the big the world today or the world tomorrow or whatever it was back then. The plain truth. Plain yeah. lies. <laughs> well, I tell you what, they really named it. Jehovah Witnesses. Just think about that term. The Jehovah Antichrist? That's what they are. Antichrist. anti Jehovah. Because Jehovah, they deny. They deny the Jehovah of the Bible. It says the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and it says, Karisi men kairin. Grace. Grace. Karis. Remember what the word karis means? That's the, means, that's the word grace. For in grace you are having been saved, it says in Ephesians 2 and 8. For in grace, immersed in grace, you are having been saved. In grace. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace means that, and the idea was it of that ancient tyrantal king. That when you walk before him, if you were lucky to get out of there alive, it was by grace. That's what the word grace came from. If you got out of the presence of that tyrannical despot that you were down in front of, and you got anything, or even got out of there with your life, it was by grace. Caris. That's where that term came from. Grace, unmerited favor to you, to ye, this is an Oklahoma term. You know, I, I don't even think I talk good Okie anymore. I have to listen to Okies on the radio or something, and, and then I can copy it again and start sounding like Okie. But uh, they say you, you all, you all, except when they're talking to you all, they may be talking to one person. Hey, you all. Well, this term here. This is second person plural. This is daily plural, second person pronoun. And I think really the way it could, should be translated grammatically correctly would be you all or ye in Old English. In Old English, when I was talking, when you were talking to one person, they would say you. But when they was talking to a crowd of people, they would say ye all. Mm -hmm. All right? Well, this term should be translated ye. Because this is plural. All right, plural. And then it says, grace to you. And then it says, kai arani. The Hebrew equivalent for arani is shalom. 
Come on. How do uh, how do Jewish people greet each other? Shalom. 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 Peace. And you'll find Greek people greeting each other. A rain, you see. A rain, a rain, a rain. Well, here we have the term. That we have a greeting term. Grace to you, Kairis, Amen, Kai, a rain. Shalom. On page 575, I'm going to write that down for future people. And you write that down in your book, too, on page 575. And Bollinger's Concordance, he puts down Irani and he puts down Shalom in there. And he said that Irani and Shalom is the absence of all grief. Total peace. Absolute serenity. Touch yourself right there, right now. With, with it. Just, they used to tell me, you know, when I was going to school and I was taking psychology in school, they had these relaxation creeps. They laugh at relaxation. You know, you would, you, would, you would relax. Now, I'm trying to explain shalom and rainy to you. Now, I'll sit there. Now, you have to get your pistols out of your hands. Just lay your hands out there on your side. Just, you can't hold on to anything. Just lay your hand there. Now, try to let your arms fall. Just let them fall. And relax every muscle in your body. Breathe deep. <laughs> I, can't, I can't relax every muscle because my heart won't stop. Well, you, it, that's an involuntary muscle. Okay? <laughs> now, this... This, this lay down, this lay, put your, or let your arms fall. If you're sitting in a recliner, this is a lot better. To lay back in a recliner and put your arms down. I want you to practice this. And I want you to remember the two words, Kari, I mean, Karimi and Shalom. Let your arms fall. See, it's, it's working on you. It's working on you right now. You're doing real good. You're a good subject. Let your arms fall. Now, do they feel a little warm? When you do that, then your arms will start getting warm. You know why it gets warm? Blood. Blood starts going to the surface, the epidermis of your body. Otherwise, it doesn't get there all the time. But when you totally relax, you feel this blood getting all the way to the surface of your body. And that's when you rela relax. And then you'll feel your heart beating and slowing down. And it'll slow down and slow down and slow down. And you breathe deep and pretty soon you're out in the twilight zone rest and you're sleeping. Well, they told you this is what's called relaxation procedures. But there are relaxation procedures in Christ. That's what it says. In Christ. Relaxation procedures in Christ. Relaxing in Christ. Grace and peace. Page 575 in, in Bullinger's book, he, he talks about this. The last note that I ever had of Brother Hubbard my friend, my teacher. I was listening to him. How much of today was I listening to Brother Hubbard, my dear little wife? Uh, hmm? All the time. I found a whole lot of tapes that he that I had when I was going to church with him there, and I was listening to him preach. He's a great Hebrew and Greek scholar. I mean, a scholar, mm -hmm. an English scholar too. And he would really use a lot of adjectives to describe. Them. A lot of illustrations when he was preaching or teaching. But the last thing that I have, I have a little note by him. And he was dying. He had Alzheimer's or dementia or something. He taught in the seminary at, in Los Angeles for 30 something years. He taught in the seminary up in Riverbank. He taught in the seminary in Little Rock, Arkansas. And he taught up in Fresno for about 25 years. Which means over 60 years he taught in seminaries. When he was very old, he would go by my house on the way and he would stop in and I, he would use the restroom and he'd go and drive all the way from Lancaster to Fresno. We'd drive up there on Sunday night and then come back on Wednesday. He started getting lost and running off in the alfalfa fields, going through barbed wire fences, just doing all kinds of stuff. He was losing his mind. 
but he knew what he was supposed to do. His church finally basically talked him into resigning. He didn't want to resign, but they, they told him they wanted to call somebody that could pastor better because he was not able to pastor. Well, it broke his heart. And he uh, just was losing it. And I tried to talk to him, tried to meet with him, everything. He'd get lost. He, we couldn't meet anywhere. I was living in Nevada at that time. Finally, his daughter came and picked him up. He had been going up to the school and teaching Greek and Hebrew and English, still in Fresno. He didn't know where his classroom was. They'd have to get him by the hand and take his books that he was supposed to have and lead him to the classroom and set him down at the desk. And once he opened his book, he was fine. He could teach just like he always taught. One of the last notes that he ever wrote was in Bollinger's book, on page 575 of what happened to his library, I don't even know. Nobody knows where his library was. Mm -hmm. But I got his Bible, and I got this note that he wrote, Bollinger, page 575. That's why I remember that. Mm -hmm. And he wrote all the descriptions of a rainy and shalom down there. Because the God of peace, I believe, was ushering him into God's kingdom. Was ready to go home. I talked to him the last time, and, and Brother Hubbard, I, I called him and I said, Brother Hubbard, what are you doing? He said, Oh, he said, I'm tired. I said, What have you been doing? He said, I, he said John Wayne and I moved 10,000 ahead of California, 10,000 head of cattle from Oklahoma into Texas. Being serious. <laughs> He sat around and watched John Wayne movies, and that was just about all he could do. Was just, he didn't know where he was. He'd get lost. He couldn't drive his car anymore or anything. He was finished. He had run his race. But he wrote down Irene and Shalom. And all the descriptions of that peace that they give that's found in Jesus Christ. He knew where he was going. Well, I'll leave that with you tonight. That little lecture from him, that little piece of it. And I should have brought that note in his Bible tonight. Because that's the way I want to end this lesson. Peace I give to you, Paul said to that church. Peace and grace. Because grace, the grace of God, you have shed in your life. And I pray that you're here tonight and you, are not, you don't know yourself that God can give you that peace and He'll give you that grace because He is not willing that any should perish and go to hell. I told my wife the other day that I would sure like to see this next year for Halloween, I wish Christian people would get together and, and put up a, a Halloween deal that entitled A Trip Through Hell. And go in there and see and walk by the lake of fire and go through a room where there's nothing but darkness and smelling. I mean, I want the, all the senses. You can see the flames of fire, these people suffering out there. There could be the hounds of hell chewing on their legs. Nobody's ever going to die. They can chew and chew and chew and you're not going to die. And the worms going through the bodies. As it talks about, that Jesus talked about, the worm that eats and eats and eats and, and gnaws at them, but they're not going to die pulling their hair out and screaming for terror and torment and the flames. Thirsting. I need a drink of water. I need a drink of water. Please give me one drip of water off of Lazarus' tongue. Off of his end of his finger. And then let him smell hell. You could take some old chicken feathers and set them on fire and burn them. Burning, rotting flesh. Go out there and get a roadkill someplace and, and put that on the barbecue pit and just let that I mean, this this is... I'm, I'm telling you what hell is really like. This is what hell is really like. Let them walk through this place and then when they finally come out of it after about a half a mile of seeing all... Maybe Elvis Presley over here and Jerry Lee Lewis over here and famous people and 
And then the poor people, you know, all kinds of people have gone to hell. <coughs> Gandhi. <coughs> I wish I had another chance. One more chance. Send my brothers back. Don't let them come to this terrible place. As old Venus said. Then when you come out of the place, have a, a forked road. Saying the right, wide road to hell. Do you really want to go there? Now that you've got an eye, a look at Lucia. Or the narrow pathway to heaven through Jesus Christ only. Well, I think that shakes the world up. Like I said the other day, I wouldn't even charge anybody to go there. Get them in there and then say it's fifty dollars is all true. <laughs> <laughs> to get out of here, they pay ten million dollars to get out. And then when they got out, put it on the credit. You know, make them sign a back voucher <laughs> to go on the rest of the way. You know, they get lost in there. Then let him go on out the rest of the way. And then when he got out of there, you can either pay this money or you can let Jesus pay. Well, it would be something. I don't know why no one's thought about that yet. But with all of the animation and everything that we've got today, they could really do something like that. A trip or a walk through hell. Well, I'm going to tell you, it's real. You're facing hell if you leave this world without Christ. And it's not going to have a door at the end of it either. There's no door. No exit. No exit. It's eternal, just like eternal life. Man was made and created to be an eternal being. You either go spend eternal life in two places, with God or in hell. That's it. Father, thank you for your word. Fly up to our hearts. Forgive us for your family. Help us to witness for you every day. Help each and every one of these lessons that, that go out and on camera, on video, audio, CD. Help them touch people's lives. Help them to teach. And forgive me where I fail. Help me to what life of mine I have left that let it be for you. In Jesus' name I pray. If you did that, I could advertise it in my newspaper. Oh, well, that's great. <laughs> you tell what you we need to do something like that someplace, don't we? You put out a voice